Um, I would like to announce that tomorrow, the day after, maybe tomorrow, we have a unscheduled panel discussion on the question whether we are already at the point of that the basis is going permanent into permanent backwardation. We are very fortunate to have uh, Nathan Nerusis of Vancouver, Canada here and Gran Suchetki of the Perth Mint. <laughs> <laughs> I have talked to them and it seems to me that the situation is far more advanced than I thought it was when I was preparing for this. So what I I just have to take all bets off. <laughs> I was <laughs> I, I was suggesting two years, but this stands to be revised after I have listened to their presentation. I think it's extremely interesting, and, and I, I expect a great deal from them, and I'm sure you will have uh, interesting questions to ask them. So we'll start tomorrow. I will set up a time for them, one of the four daily sittings, and, and uh, I in, invite your active participation. So we are looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, this is my turn. Uh, what, what I'm doing here basically is I'm going to try to put some of this theory into practical sort of, you know, real numbers and this kind of thing. Um, and with that, uh, there's one thing that I want to do to go back uh, to retreat a little bit on the uh, the, uh, uh, the basis uh, in terms of the grain elevator example. Um, it occurred to me as I was looking around that maybe there's a lot of blank faces as to what the basis even is. Um, we know it's the difference between fusion and spot prices, but uh, in terms of how does a grain elevator operator use the basis, what does that mean to them? Um, I don't think we really need to all the dots. So um, the first thing I want to do is just to go back because I think it's pretty important to understand how that works because that's really where we build off of the basis uh, in terms of uh, the gold warehouse and what you would do as a, as a trader on the basis. Uh, so I, I like to use uh, boards, and so I'm going to do this. Uh, if anyone can't see this, please let me know. I might be able to adjust a little bit. Uh, so, you, you might like to, sorry to interrupt, you might like sure. to take it slightly further back so that the people okay. uh, on the left of the room can, can see. Okay. We can see it now. Okay. Well, we can see it, but I think you might have people on the other side. We'll let you know. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, but even before we go to the to green elevators, uh, uh, as an example, uh, we have to actually take another step back because the, uh, there's a concept here that, that I don't think I even really appreciated at first when I started studying this, which is the what really is the spot price. Uh, we talk about the spot price like it's some easy to determine sort of, you know, well, of course it's the physical price of gold, silver, whatever commodity is being traded, but in fact, the spot price is, is a, a price that happens between two parties it's typically not an exchange. When it is an exchange, it's difficult enough to determine that, for example, at the LBMA, they do something called the daily fix, so that the price, the official price uh, for a spot gold or uh, silver uh, trade uh, on a daily basis in London is determined twice a day for gold and once a day for silver. The reason being is because all throughout the day, you literally have individual parties trading uh, 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 gold and silver, but it's not standardized. So unlike a futures contract where it's each contract is for 5,000 ounces on the COMEX for silver or 100 ounces for gold, transactions are all sizes in, in the spot market and all sorts of terms. Delivery in two days, delivery for allocated accounts, unallocated, uh, million ounces, 50,000 ounces, all over the place. Uh, so there's nothing standardized about it. And as a result, uh, there really isn't 
we talk about a spot price, but truly the, the spot price is just a guesstimate as to what really these transactions are taking place at. Um, there is no exchange for this, so when, you, when we get the Kitco price, some of you guys are familiar, you see the Kitco spot price, that's not really a price that it represents actual trades that occur. That is a feed from a bullion bank that tells you what customers on one side are willing to sell at and what customers on the other side are willing to buy at any one moment in time. Then they have an algorithm that essentially averages that and comes up with what you think the spot price might be. Uh, so th this is actually pretty important because, again, going back to the basis where the difference between the spot price and the futures price, but futures price is actually much as we think in the futures markets are enigmatic, it's, it's pretty precise. And you know exactly each trade you can get data for. I, I get data for every single trade that happens in the futures market. I know exactly how many contracts at what price, everything. A spot price, you do not get that. Um, the only reason we get that is because the bullion banks are kind enough to, <laughs> to tell us what it is. But of course, you know, they may have their own interests in, in this algorithms, I mean, imagine if you have gold, someone wants to sell gold at, let's say, $700, and someone wants to buy gold uh, at uh, $650, you, you can have that at certain times. Uh, that's a pretty wide range. So what price does the bullion bank tell you is the spot price? Is it going to be closer to $700? Is it going to be closer to $650? $675, do they split in the middle? Do they do they make changes? We don't know this. Uh, and so it is actually a, a one piece of the basis that is enigmatic and, and really difficult to try to get handled. Um, with that said on the spot price, uh, let me go back to the grain. Um, so we represent this as a grain elevator. Um, and This is my best rendition of wheat. <laughs> this is literally a farmer that has that that, uh, that is that is uh, that is growing the wheat. Now he's harvested it, and so now he wants to sell it. Uh, he has two options. One, he can try to find a buyer out in the spot market immediately. Uh, but as the professor was saying earlier, of course, the harvest typically happens around the same time. So you've got all the farmers trying to sell at the same time. If that was the case, then. All who were trying to find buyers immediately for consumption, they would drive the price into the ground, and the last sale would be at like a penny for whatever. I mean, we to So, um, recognizing this, of course, uh, we've got the grain elevator uh, operator that says, Well, I can store your wheat, and uh, I can give you a price for all of your wheat that is maybe not as much as you can get for the first. You know, a bushel that you sell, but it's going to be much higher than you would get if you try to sell all of it at once. Uh, so what happens is the the farmer will sell the wheat, and this, strange enough, is also a spot price. And this illustrates again that really, when you talk about the spot price, it it you know, it's it's not just a single thing. It's with whoever you're doing it. With. In this case, uh, the uh, literally. The uh, farmer would be selling the wheat, as it were, to the elevator operator. Uh, now we know that the elevator operator here is in the business of making money off of storage, right? So uh, he's bought, let's say, wheat at three dollars a bushel, and he is now going to be selling it in the future, while the you know uh, until the next harvest is coming up, at whatever price that he can get. Uh, to the eventual users, the bakeries, or whatever, whoever is that's using wheat. Um, he needs to make sure that he's not taking a loss the same way that the farmer would have taken a loss by selling later in the year. And the way he does this is he goes to the futures market. So this is where sort of the futures come into play. These are really bad. I represent the futures market's money because uh, the, the people that are in the futures market that are that the grain elevators op operator is selling to are speculators. These are people that are um, in the business of trying to second guess uh, the, the price and betting directionally, either up or down, long or short, uh, to essentially make money off of the movement uh, of the price of wheat. Um, 
in effect, what they're going to do is they're going to say, So if the grain elevator operator is selling in the, in the future, in six months, um, wheat to a speculator in the futures market, um, that speculator is uh, going to have a certain price that uh, he is going to uh, want, obviously. Um, and that price is going to take into account his own expectations for what the price is going to be. I don't think that was the better. Oh, it gets you the um, this price here, interestingly, is based on nothing else. It's not based on what the storage cost here is, even though we talked about the basis. Remember, the cost of the basis is really the represents the cost of this storage. But really, the way that the speculator is approaching this is they just simply come up with a price that they think, um, you know, they the. Um, in fact, at the time, in six months, what the spot price might be at. Uh, because as you recall, the spot price and the futures price will converge at the, uh, at, at the time that this future contract is expiring. And so, obviously, if you're going long, you want the price to go higher. You don't want to pay, uh, you know, you don't want to pay $3.60, for example, if you think that in six months, the spot price or what you can sell wheat at for is going to be 320 pay 360, you won't pay. You want to pay obviously less than that, so uh, maybe you want to pay $3. But someone's already selling in a spot basis today at $3, so that's not going to work. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is this dynamic between, you know, uh, grounds up approach from how much you, you know, you want to get the least amount here, but really, if you're already selling at a spot price here, there's, uh, a floor underneath the price, and there's a ceiling of the price. Uh, now let's approach it back from the other side. Um, so we know this, he wants, uh, the speculator doesn't want to pay uh, too much. Obviously, the green elevator operator doesn't want to pay, uh, doesn't want to get too little. He needs to make sure that the price he paid, which is three dollars, and the price he's going to get is going to cover the cost of storage. And the cost of storage includes fundamentally the um, uh, cost of constructing the elevator, the amortization of the capital that was put into it, but also includes insurance. And actually, most importantly, in the grain market, this is an aside, it, it includes the cost of transporting it from the elevator to the uh, destination, which is typically a, a large grain exchange like Kansas City or Chicago, from which you would distribute grain uh, across you know, to, to various uh, markets throughout the world. Uh, so he has a certain price that he must cover here. So let's say for six months, that's 25 cents. Okay. So if he knows if he can buy wheat at $3 and his cost is 25 cents for the cost of storage, the futures, the minimum futures price or what he's willing to sell at is going to be $3.25. Right, three plus twenty-five. So in effect, if you think about this, he's not even going to buy here the spot price unless he can get um, unless he can sell in a futures market for 325. As soon as he's as soon as he's bought here at three dollars, he's got immediate risk that the price could go down because let's say that uh, FDA or uh, USDA report comes out and says the wheat harvest is triple the size of what it was. <laughs> wheat collapses a dollar. He just bought for three dollars. He's on a two dollar loss. So so the way this is actually done is the first thing that the uh, the, the grain elevator operator will do is call his broker and say, what's what's my basis? Uh, and the, the, what, because, uh, no, let me back up a little bit. Uh, this is probably, <laughs> yeah. Let's just say that he, he will call his, his broker and say, what is the futures price? And they'll say, okay, well, 320 
is what you know someone's willing to uh, buy at, and uh, working backwards, you would then say, well, my cost is two, two, uh, 25 cents for storage, so I can only pay 295. Okay, see how that works? Yep. So this is an important thing because it demonstrates that it's a two-way road. This is what this is. A, not, no one really talks about this, but this is like the most fundamental thing about the basics. That you've got inputs from both the futures. Someone's only going to pay a certain price, and there's a floor and a ceiling on that. And then there's this storage component here. When that's added back into that, you get back to the spot market. The guy that's selling wheat, you can sell to grain operator, a uh, grain elevator operator at a certain price. You can sell directly to a bakery or whoever, you know, end user uh, at some price. So he won't even put it here if that price is too low. And that price might be too low because this price is too low. So if you don't have speculators in the market, what happens? So your price, your right? So depending on um, uh, in this particular situation, um, if there's less speculators in the market, the top price paid might be 280. So the most that he could pay to the uh, farmer is 255. So your price is lower. So in effect, the future market is as, as, as much as it's maligned, and in fact, even in, in gold and silver works this way, has just a natural tendency, just by its own existence, to essentially provide a, a, a price. It's a price stabilizer, but in this instance, in that ground, it actually can get a higher price than you would, than you would otherwise get. Uh, now, it gets way beyond this and gets more complex, but, but what I'm trying to ex explain here is this dynamic that occurs. Uh, <clears throat> that, that there's a, a, a mechanism okay, that essentially uh, gets to a certain price and price with the inputs from both, both directions. And if you think back what I just started this with is with the spot price and there's the bids and asks at different rates and you kind of come to a, to a, a certain level, um, it actually plays into that, into that same theory. Uh, and that's actually the reason why, for example, Kitco doesn't, I believe, that, you know, they don't publish the actual trading price, but they use these algorithms to kind of come up with what um, what should be the price that it's that, that trades settle at. Any individual trade could be all over the place, but if you're in the market long enough, you see where this is coming from, you see where this is coming from, from the speculators, what speculators want to pay, what producers are willing to sell at. You close that gap and you use these algorithms uh, algorithms to essentially come up with a price. Um, unfortunately, because it is the bullying banks, you you know it, 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 it gives you a sense of well, step back. But um, in the next couple of days, you know, I'll go through some things that kind of provide some examples of how you could actually uh, uh, look at some other data to make sure that the prices that you're getting for the spot price aren't off. Uh, so even though this is uh, uh, something that, that seems enigmatic, we can use other data from different markets because there, there are quite a few markets where gold and silver if you're creative enough to think of what they, you know, what they are, that you can actually sort of triangulate and make sure that the prices that you're looking at are like totally out of the um, Are there any questions on this? Uh, does it always get squeezed back on the producer? In your example, it seems that everything that was dictated by the futures was squeezed back back to the producer. So the grain elevator operator was limited by what he could say as the price to the producer of the wheat based on what was being happening between himself and the future flow-on effect back to the producer always in effect, or is it just because of this particular example that you provide? I think that, well, there's two, two pieces to this. One is that the, the green elevator operator couldn't care less what the spot or the future price is. All they care is that they get more than this. If they can get more than 25 cents, they make money on the difference between the two. They get less than 25 cents. <coughs> Presumably, they don't, you know, they don't sell the storage, but they may have fixed costs they have to cover, so they might actually, sell, you know, they might actually do a transaction of less. 
here this is this is essentially what the basis is. So just sorry. Does but that, no, okay, but but no. Does that mean that they should push back onto the futures market? Ask I think there price? there are there are certainly these are that's why I try to explain this as a dynamic. So I don't think there's any static producers always have the edge or speculators have the edge. Um, although I would say in the gold and silver market, especially in the COMEX, the speculators probably at some time, certain periods of time, have the edge. Uh, the, and especially with uh, uh, with silver now in the last few years, the leasing has really there's almost no leasing and there's very little forward selling by by producers. So it's almost an inducement, as it were, right, to get <laughs> to get this trade to take place. Uh, whereas for for grain, you know there you know there isn't really too much of a choice. You either sell for what you can get for today, or you sell to a grain elevator operator that is put into storage. But typically, this price will be you know will probably usually be a little bit lower. It's just that there's only so much of uh, immediate demand that there is out there. So once this is fulfilled, typically this will end up being the better price. And that's being held up by how much the speculators are willing to uh, take uh, long positions in this case uh, against the short that the greater. So that's what we have focus. But um, and, and this the this is how I I don't know if this is fundamentally right, but the way I think about the basis is is long physical, short the futures. But certainly, if someone's got a different mindset or they're pulling back, maybe they're thinking short physical long futures. It's the flip side, so it should work the same way, but uh, it just seems unholy to me. <laughs> you know, to say short to physical. <laughs> you gotta be long to physical. Uh, any other questions on this? Yeah. Just on this. Could you please stand up? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> In this situation here, with the futures market, producers can still dictate the price if there's a shortage of grain. In other words, it's a situation. Correct. Right. That's the dynamic. That's the dynamic. Right. What happens with the, the gold market if it's in a constant deficit syndrome? Yeah, okay, you've got central banks selling into it, but I mean, it, it's a different market, isn't it? If you've got a constant deficit. How do they, I mean, shouldn't the dynamic change a little bit there? I think if you've got a constant deficit and there isn't yeah. central bank selling and there isn't leasing, there's all these other things, yeah. paper being substituted yeah, for okay. physical. Yeah. I think you probably would have the situation where the producers, I think that's what you're trying to get at. Yeah. If you took away all those other things, yeah. made them illegal or something else, mm. would the producers be in a position, position to dictate, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. or not necessarily dictate the price, but be yeah. on the, you know, on the forward side well, of the dynamic? Like why they never do, that's all. Cool. Right. Well, you know, because uh, I mean, we can get into this, but you know, sure, they, right. they have to pay for you know the yeah. diesel and for labor yeah. and such. So they have to sell the gold that they produce, sure. unless if the gold price is so much above the marginal cost of production that they can withhold okay. a portion yeah. of the production. Um, but yeah, I mean, that wouldn't be a strategy unless you were in a situation that you yeah, had sure. no alternatives uh, other than you know, selling directly to the end or whoever was processing it for the end users. But because you have the futures on the other side, you in fact have the demand that all sets. I mean, I suppose that in some respects, the speculators can take advantage of that. for well, the gold companies have to sell because they have to pay their costs. You know, so and there know. might be strategies, but if yeah. you're just looking at this as a transaction, yeah, this, this, happens concept, in, yeah. this happens in real time and it's yeah. a matching process. So. Yeah. You know, I mean, I guess if someone was willing to buy more futures in this case, uh, you know, I suppose, but there's actually, well, I get, I don't know if I'm going to get to this today, but... Uh, there's also the other side of it, too. Uh, could you the, stand up if you're going to... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Towards the other side of it, too, is that in the grain situation, they usually take the contract, they usually take delivery, don't they? Whereas in the futures, they hold that, they don't. No, they don't back now. <coughs> oh, oh, okay. Not usually. Not usually. Not usually. No. Uh, most most uh, contracts are, 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 are pulled forward. Pull forward. Um, some are some are settled. Mm -hmm. Some are it's called exchange for physical, where you create a futures contract by exchanging for physical one. Right. But, but yeah, most uh, are not. 
you have a question? I'm sorry. Cool. Well, I'm not so much a question, just an answer to that. I mean, at least from the firm experience, gold miners don't actually deal with the physical. As soon as they get to the refinery, they want to credit in market and they're out of the physical. Okay. So there's this, there is this disconnect where the producer is not really engaged in that market in the physical sense of saying, right, oh, there's a jeweler, do you want it? There's a mint, do you want it? It's like, I've washed my hands, I've done this, so I've given it to the refiner, but it's credit in market, and now I'll play some game with a bullion bank on a fraud or a futures or a trading on an unallocated amount. So, you know, in that sense, the power is not there. Right, sort of, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I'm, I'm trying to be really, really sure, simple. Sure. You, but these are good questions because yeah. I think they help understand some of this. Um, okay. So I'm going to sort of build on this concept. Uh, hopefully I can explain this. I was trying to explain it to myself. I don't think I really fully got it, so we'll <laughs> see how it goes. But um, what I want to illustrate here is the, um, is the idea that in gold and silver, they're unique because their contango cannot increase above a certain amount. So we talked about the 25 cents on that previous page for the grain operator, grain only operator. Presumably there might be a scenario where that could be a dollar, two, you know, three or whatever. I mean, you know, depending on what the scenario is. In gold and silver, I don't think that could happen. It hasn't happened historically, and I think the reason it hasn't happened is because of the Okay. We're going to take a fantastical situation where the uh, Futures price of gold is thousand dollars. So let's just make this December. So I'm going to say this is this December 2009 contract for gold. <coughs> so what this means is that <coughs> I could I would essentially sell gold at thousand dollars in one year for December 2009. Um, but let's say that the spot price of gold. But what I can buy gold for today is $800. Okay. So can, can everyone tell me what the what the contango here is? Is this $200? Absolutely. We'll get into it in the next couple of days why we really don't want to think about it as $200. But for this example, uh, well, actually, we may need to. Um, let's see how it goes. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so in this case, we have a $200 handle. Yeah. If, if you were presented with this, what would you do? Buy. What would you do? Buy. Buy what? Buy the first one. And then do what? Sell it. No, you do something better. <laughs> Sell it. Sell it. <laughs> Sells where? So you're saying buy this and then sell that one, sell the futures? Well, you've done a horrible thing. You've sold a futures contract. You're short. Well, you're not naked, but would you? are you still really recommending that you should do this? <laughs> no? Would, would, is there someone here that wouldn't, wouldn't do this? Because then we're going to be poor and not make a it for 200 bucks. Yeah. Why not right? store it for 200 bucks for a year? Why not? What would it cost you? It's one ounce of gold. How much money is it going to cost you to store it for a year? Well, <laughs> assuming assuming you're a professional, but assuming that you're you know, like one like half a percent is I think what it costs. Okay, to, to store allocated gold, but half a percent of a thousand or even 800 dollars is four dollars. Right. So soon as you do this, what have you done? See that? Yeah. Yeah. Risk free, right? Yeah. Meaning nothing, doesn't matter what happens with the price of gold, it could go to a dollar, go to a million dollars, doesn't matter. You have immediately locked in $196 game. Right? Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> okay, based on American, American dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this might be a realistic price for Australian dollars, I don't know. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that if you could, if you would be willing to do this, you think there are people more like you know, uh, 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 you say uh, predatory <laughs> in the market. 
that would be want to do it even more than you. Let's say, let's say it wasn't this. Let's say it was. Nine ninety today and a thousand here. Would you still do it? Yeah. It's the you might well. it may not be worth it because yeah. now you put nine ninety and you could have like gotten a CD at three percent or whatever that's going to earn you thirty dollars. You're eating at six dollars, right? So, but there might be right. There could be someone. Why? Why would someone need to even do this even though they could earn three dollars, three three percent on a CD or? Thirty dollars for it. Expect that rise in the price. Future. Well, you already sold. Market. You already sold. Already sold. Already sold. You could, but but you would still only have this whatever tiny one 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 percent. What if you leverage? Leverage? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could. <laughs> Fifty but, to one. But you're buying the nine ninety. This is cash you're putting out today, right? Okay, so I think what the reason might be is because you own this gold for a full year. So what what is your fear? Why would you do? Because remember we talked about one ninety six risk free gain. Why would you not take ninety to ninety thousand dollars and put it into a CD at a bank uh, before they started guaranteeing pretty much everything in the world? And even if they did, it's still just dollars, so right? Because this this can go someplace. This can go to nothing. I mean, as we might learn from Nathan and uh, Braun, you know, next tomorrow that maybe we're closer that you know the nine hundred ninety dollars to put a CD could go to nothing, but the nine hundred dollars, ninety dollars in gold is going to be there. But what if this guy defaults and can't buy it for a thousand? <laughs> then you keep it. So that's the worst case scenario: is that the other guy defaults, right? So there's probably some level at which you might be willing to do this. Even though you earn less than what you might earn put, putting that money into a, a CD. So if you're predatory enough and you're thinking along these lines and you weigh your risks, you know, properly and you're thinking that well, if I keep it in, you know, in fiat, then it, you know, it can go to nothing. If I have this goal that locked in some gain, and then and the worst that can happen to me is this guy defaults and and, and remember, and this, and this, and this money could be borrowed also. So this might not even be your money. You know, you could have borrowed this. You know, you could borrow yen, for example. And then how much did you pay there? Half a percent, a quarter, maybe zero. So you know, you've got a lot to work with. Okay. Um, now this has all sorts of implications. But what I want to demonstrate here is that in gold and silver, it's virtually impossible to have a contango that 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 exceeds. Uh, Interest, the rate of interest, and even then, it's typically it's typical that the contango is going to be some fraction of that. Okay. Whereas, at, at, I don't know if some of you guys can read my website. I put a thing out there a few weeks ago saying that the commodity complex was still sort of collapsing because not only are people, not only were there speculators at the hedge funds and investment funds, but there's also speculation that was being done by the. Uh, the producers themselves that they were buying additional inventory on the way up, and now they're selling. And it's really it doesn't require a lot because prices are throwing margins. That it wouldn't take a lot of selling, you know. Of uh, the example I gave was rhodium, which is actually something that someone wrote up a few months ago. I think it was GM that bought a bunch of rhodium on the way up, and then they got squeezed, and they brought in a new purchasing manager, and they decided, well, we're going to sell at the top. They start selling at the, you know ten thousand. And rhodium is out fourteen hundred dollars, down eighty six percent. So that's just one market, but palladium, uh, uh, nickel, zinc. Yeah, you look at every single commodity, and you see these sixty, eighty percent drops. You look at how much the speculative, speculative uh, positions are in the you know, in the various futures markets. They haven't dropped as much as they increased to increase prices. So I think the missing element of this is the uh, is is what some no one's really focusing at, which are which are producers. That in fact have been uh, uh, dumping, not a lot, but it doesn't take a lot in a market that's pretty weak where there's almost no one buying. Um, in any case, what I'm trying to say is that back in 2001, I was, uh, what I was trying to say is the uh, um, my theory was that the point at which uh, the commodity markets will bottom is when professionals will start buying the physical in order to store it and sell it forward. And the storage costs will be such a small fraction of what they can sell it for at 
that it's a risk-free profit. Just the same as I illustrated here, except you do it in oil, you do it in wheat, you do it at whatever it is, like you do it, okay? And so I, I was just thinking, well, what, you know, what kind of contango would there have to be historically? Like, what are some large contangles that we've seen that would mark bottoms, okay? And so I didn't do this in a lot of different things. I only had a couple of people that said that won't be, but uh, I did look at oil, and it turns out that in 2001, oil, uh, and I used two different contracts, it was December 2001, oil, and, and I did this in October 15th, whatever, so on October 15th of 2001, the December 2001, oil future contract was trading at $24, okay, $24 per barrel, right? And then the March 2002 futures contract was trading at $28. Now that 24, 28 doesn't seem like a huge amount, but when you actually annualize that and translate it to an annual rate differential between those two, it turns out to be 56%. So theoretically, all you have to do is buy you know, at 24, sell at 28, figure out how to store it for three months, and whatever that costs, you subtract 56% from it, and, and you know, that's very, very healthy. <laughs> We're nowhere near that. Right now, oil is pretty much like even. It was actually backwardation, and now it's just starting to go into the tango. So, you know, it may have quite a ways to go before, you know, maybe even finding a bottom. If this is the theory that sticks in terms of when the bottom is formed, when producers are no longer um, dumping, not dumping is a, is a strong word, selling incrementally, but more importantly, when professionals it's, spe it's not speculation, but it's, it's a warehouse. It's a warehouse. It's, I mean, they're going to earn a risk-free profit. They can lock in, you know, what their cost is for storage. They, just by doing this, they're going to, you know, lock it in. Um, the difference, of course, being that if someone defaults on this, you're stuck with oil. And, you know, <laughs> it's not as good as being stuck with, with, with gold or silver. I mean, I don't know. I, I haven't personally done it, but I would presume it's easier to, <laughs> to be stuck. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't know where I'm going to store my barrels of oil. <laughs> so, and that's exactly, I think, one of the reasons why um, the, you're never going to see this in gold and silver. For one, because of this, but for, for two, because I asked you guys here, and people are willing to almost do it at $990 because it's so easy to store gold and silver. We talked about the, you know, people wear, warehousing for themselves, but really professional warehousing is still a legitimate business. It may be for a few more months. Probably long, enough for, <laughs> probably long enough for everyone to be able to take advantage of a contango that got way out of control. And certainly for someone that's a professional, you know, sort of a, a bullion bank or even an investor, it can be anyone, but someone with a lot of money, obviously, that uh, um, that would take advantage of the situation. Um, there, this, I think this is like the most important thing um, that most professional analysts that I've talked to or read their stuff, they, they totally miss this because this, this contango and the fact that it can't go past a certain limit explains why, what, what the effect of uh, the uh, hedging that was done in the 80s, starting in the 80s and through the 90s and through the 2000s with Barrick and all those guys, what the central bank leasing and gold sales, why those, what, why the effects on the, the price was what it was. Um, and I don't know if I'll have a chance to get into this. I'll have to, again, try to explain it to myself <laughs> so that I can understand it well before I can explain it to you. But um, it, this one concept is able to explain all those things. And meanwhile, you see all these people sort of coming up with these complex, you know, explanations for exactly how you obviously sell, you know, you, when, you, when you forward sell, you, 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 then there's a long position, so you want to lease and, and No, this, this, if I have time in the next couple of days, uh, really explains it all. And uh, I think it, it, it opened my mind, really, to understanding price dynamics, uh, and again, it, it works because of the basis. If you don't start out with the, with the basis of, you know, as your, as your precept, or as your, you know, your sort of frame, framework, you don't get to this. And because no one really studies the basis, no one else has really gotten to this. Any questions on this? Are we not seeing a contradiction of that in the current share markets where equities are trading more below cash value? Uh, so there's 
just a matter of perception. The market doesn't believe you make money in the future. It doesn't matter how much cash you've got. These companies are trading at less than cash. Right. Right. No, I actually, I, I, we, we actually do this thing, um, we have a service we, one of the things we do is try to find all those companies in the junior mining sector. We have them look at Australia, but Canada, U.S. Um, we're now up to 100 companies, uh, I think 1,800 of the junior, even some senior gold, silver, all sorts of mining companies that are trading at less than cash. Um, I think that's a little bit different, but may have some applicability because that's obviously happened as a result of very few buyers. <laughs> And these large funds like RAM, Special Situations, Osprey, all these funds, they're going out of business or having to, you know, redeem, you know, large, uh, you know, people put money out of hedge funds. They're just dumping these junior stocks. And in the best of days, junior stocks don't have a very large door for anyone to exit. But, you know, I'm sure any of the guests that invest in this know that, you know, the, the sort of thing that, you know, the exit is very, very small in the junior stock market, meaning that you, it's very difficult to squeeze through. There's a bunch of people selling. You're, you know, you might have 10 million shares on dock to be sold, and maybe only 10 10,000 share of demand for a day. So, work at the price of, of, of a stock, a good stock, with a lot of cash, more cash than shares are trading for. <coughs> if you've got 3 million shares uh, on the block to be sold and only 10,000 to be bought, it's going to trade below its cash. It's an adjustment period. It's not going to keep. It's not going to stay below its cash. But until that this that that that, that process is completed, until those 3 million shares that need to be sold are sold. 10,000 shares at a time, you know, how much is that, 300 days, whatever, I'm just using an example, but, you know, you're, it could take a long time to do that. You're saying that situation can't happen in that way. No. So the situation, the equivalent here would be someone selling physical gold, right? So if someone just was saying, where perceptions become such that you people won't buy them at any time. People that won't buy gold at any price. So there, there, there's some people that are buying gold because you know I'll buy gold at some price. And many of you probably, if you found out that there's 10 ounces sitting, you know, at the local coin shop here, might want to buy those 10 ounces today. So, and I don't think you, you really, you know, you can really say that in this case. Are, are there a lot of you guys here that are buying, you know, three million shares of juniors? <laughs> but, but look, they're trading below cash. I mean, it's, it's risk-free profits, my friend. <laughs> Everyone's looking for that, right? I'm looking for it to turn around. You should be buying it because, it, you know, especially when you've got when you've got 100 million cash, and some of these companies have, and a 25 million market cap, and what could go wrong? Unless they have these, the cash of these ABCs, or you know, because maybe the, the, maybe that's the part of it. If you get if you if you're a believer. And, and this is what this report we wrote, with the title was actually Cash is King with a question mark. Meaning typically, obviously, you know, people say cash is king, but if you're a junior investor, you don't want your company to be, to have, you know, cash sitting around because you believe cash is trash. So you might actually punish him for having a cash. It's kind of a dichotomy, but, you know, that might also play into it that in fact, you know, holding 60 million in treasury, US treasuries, or 60 million at, at a bank account someplace where, you know, 250, like the U.S. is 250,000 is the FDIC insurance. Who knows if they'll raise it to 50 million? They probably will at some point, but maybe not before this thing goes. You know, bank goes out and then you lose all the cash. So that could also play into it. Even though you have cash, it's trash. This is gold, though. No one's going to say that about gold. Um, and and when gold price has been pressured, now I don't know. It's hard to say. Has the selling that's happened the last three months? How much of it was physical? How much of it was uh, how much of it was uh, futures? You know, whatever it was, there was a relationship as both kind of came down. Now, so we'll see in the next couple of days that we've had two prices, the, the futures and the spot price converge, the contango decreasing. And, and there's the, the main reason for that actually is the small, you know, retail uh, buyer. It doesn't take a huge amount to sort of start upsetting this market when it's gone long. You know, this, the retail buying really started in February, March. You know, but it didn't really gain the steam until prices, you know, especially in silver, came down to like twelve, thirteen, fourteen dollars, and then all hell broke loose, and you couldn't find any more silver. And you know, I don't know how much it was probably thirty, it was thirty or forty million ounces. That's a very significant amount, and it's purely acting on the spot price. It has very little at ten dollars or eleven dollars. It has really very little to do with the futures. Very different from the wholesale market, where almost every transaction involves. 
a Ford swap or a future something, you know, they're, you know, I mean, there's outright buying there too, but it isn't typical that someone would just go out and cool, you know, just buy 40 million ounces, you know, on the wholesale market to hoard. It's probably going to happen, it's probably starting to happen, uh, but that, that wasn't the case in the last six months, but it was the case that probably about that much silver was taken off the retail, you know, off the retail shelves. Any other questions on are you telling Could us you stand up? Yes. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Are you telling us that what we should do short, uh, cover short selling, um, as long as there is contango, basically, you know, with interest rates going down virtually nil? Is, is that what you're telling us? Uh, that we should all become Chinese on gold? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would suggest that you can get this, the original number, the 800 to 1,000, for sure, unless, you know, you just don't like, you know, if you like to leave money sitting, you know, just let me know if that's the case, I'll go ahead and do that. But um, the fact is, it's very competitive. The, you know, that's why, precisely why Contango hasn't really been above, you know, this, you know, 4 or 5%. I mean, even when interest rates were higher, I didn't take it back to the late 70s, early 80s, where it was like 18%, but, you know, when I was 8 10%, it was still like in the 4 5 6% range as far as contango. Uh, and so it, you know, it really doesn't get that high because it doesn't have the chance. As soon as, it, as, soon as there's uh, the, you know, divergence, the spot price of the futures moves away from the other, some bullion bank, someone that's faster than someone else and pushing a button will take advantage of that arbitrage and lock it in. So if you can find it, I mean, you know, I'm not suggesting that you do it, but you know, consider your family's welfare. You know, please. <laughs> it's interesting because isn't it like contrary to Could you what stand up? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because it's contrary to what logic would tell you. You know, if you're bullish go, what would you show? Well in this case here, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't say you wouldn't necessarily just want to buy it outright, you know, because if you think it's gonna go easily over a thousand, now probably in eight if ninety percent, you know, of the time you're gonna be wrong. But that ten percent when you're right, you can be right in a big way, right? <laughs> Meaning go, go 5,000, whatever. So the two, 200 you'd earn here is like, you know, is nothing. But history being what it is, that only happens once in a blue moon. So, you know, you could have done this for 30, 40 years and only had a couple times when you, it would have been better for you just to buy outright. And given that you can do this three months ahead, you know, in 40 years there is, 120 periods. So you can do this 120 times and make money this way, and one time make money because the price of gold actually exceeded the, the futures price. Okay. Um, so th that's, but that's the mindset too. If you think about what bullion banks do, that's one of the reasons why they're so. You might say, well, they're inclined. If I'm conspiracy, you know, even if I'm not even thinking about conspiracy theories, they're just inclined to be short selling. But really, this mechanism here tells you why that this. Idea of shorting on the futures against physicals, and bull in bear skin, is that what you call it, right? <laughs> this is one aspect of it. Actually, th there's different ways that they can do this. This is very natural to them because banks are, in fact, arbitrage mechanisms or intermediaries. They take one rate and, you know, earn money in effect by lending at a higher rate. Or they'll take a currency and they sell it, you know, like at the airport. You know, I had 50 US dollars. What's, what's the exchange of 65, right? And at the airport, I gave him fifty dollars U.S. and I got fifty-five dollars Australian. It's like, wait a second, it's ninety? I thought it was sixty-five. <laughs> but all the fees they take out, right? So that's how they make the money. So this is just another way for them to make money. Any other questions? Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Uh, question. Actually, it's a question. Uh, can you write down your website, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question. <laughs> Uh, it's a mess right now, I'm going to tell you, but in the next few days I'm going to start updating it again. <laughs> but there's probably enough content on the blog part, which if you go, there's a little thing that says click here for recent comments, and I've probably posted about 90 comments in the last three months. So someone told me it took 26 hours to read through it. So it's probably enough for... Where are the least rates coming to this picture? The gold and silver least Okay, uh, because it's late and I don't want to torture anyone else, uh, I'll probably get into that <laughs> another day. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, it, it does come into it, and uh, I actually have a, a relatively simple way of explaining lease rates that work off this model. Once once you kind of understand this, uh, it sort of allows you to take that next step.
Tom, uh, could you, since you wrote down the website, could you, read that, maybe? Could access, you yeah, uh, say a few words about the services you, you are offering, the base, the basis tracking? I'm too humble to be that humble. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few words. Okay. Uh, yeah, so basically one of the things uh, uh, that uh, we launched a couple months ago, and I say launched, we haven't really fully launched it, but we're, ex we're already taking money. Forward selling. But no, we actually have been issuing reports, but the idea is this will be a website. Uh, it's called Metal Augmentor. It, if you go through, uh, I'll show you some space and write it down. Okay. Right now, basically, it's focused more on the on, on uh, mining companies because my partner does that almost exclusively, and he's been the one that has time to have done anything with it. Uh, he won't be able to. Um, I'll try to write it bigger later. Metalaugmentor.com. Um, this is going to be a service uh, that um, I'm going to basically have a much more in-depth analysis than I have on my own website, uh, examining these kind of factors, interrelated factors in the silver and gold market, and with an emphasis specifically <coughs> and on the metals in, in, from the framework of the basis. So I'm going to, in the next couple of days, I'm going to be showing some things here that will I will be updating and tracking as part of the service when I want to have a launch. Um, hopefully we'll launch it before the whole thing is all over. <laughs> you know, be like, I launched it this day, next day, backwardation, last one can go over. <laughs> you know, that's cool. <laughs> what do you expect? It came true. So it's like, hey, you know, too <laughs> soon. Yeah, too soon, come on. It's like free money, risk free money, right? <laughs> okay, so anyway, that's Metal Augmentor. And uh, again, it's, uh, uh, there's going to be several things with it. There, I'll, I'll try to uh, accommodate some trading philosophy and, and, and strategies. So meaning if you are a trader and you're trying to apply these concepts to your trading, you know, I'll be available to kind of help you. Um, not only if you're among the first 300 that sign up, because obviously if we're very successful and we have thousands of people, you know, I can't clean myself. But, um, uh, that'll be one piece of it. Then also, if you're just interested in sort of understanding when the last contango is happening, when the reversal, and you know all those kind of things, uh, I'll have an indicator on there to, and I hope the professor will help me on that. But between all of us, we'll you know we're gonna put up sort of our ideas on, you know, if this is just a temporary thing with you know like right now, for example, one of the things I'll talk about the next couple of days is that silver is actually very close to going to backwardation right now. But is this last, you know? Nathan and uh, Braun will probably again, you know, help shed some light on it. But that'll be the type of thing to, to say, you know, no, you know, don't, you know, don't worry. I don't know if you worry. I don't know. Some of you, some of you guys are hoping, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this is not, the, this is not, the, this is not the end. And then, and then the third part of it will be, we'll all have also, um, so just tech, pure technical charts that that if someone's doing it individually, it's it's quite difficult because you have to do it by hand. But I'll do it once, and then obviously someone, you know, whoever's subscribing will be able to, you know, look at these charts and uh, use them for their own purposes. And I'll, I'll demonstrate what one of these ways to use them uh, that actually would have been pretty profitable if I realized what was going on at the time it was. But this is, you know, it's like every time, it's pretty new. Uh, I mean, I used to just uh, look at uh, the Kitco price, the spot price I discussed earlier, where they are, you know, sort of. Uh, come up with this difference with bid and ask and futures, and that was like the whole universe of what I considered the basis a couple of years ago. And then, as I started getting understanding it more and more, I started thinking, well, you've got even down to someone mentioned eBay, you know, what the prices on eBay. I mean, that's really even fertile ground to help start understanding, you know, increasing understanding. But the the one that I've been hammering on lately in my own sort of uh, analysis is the uh, or the ETFs. I know a lot of people don't like the ETFs, but there's a mechanism by which the ETF actually does. And if you were to bear with me for a few days, I could actually demonstrate to you that when someone buys ETF shares and they're, someone's buying more than the people want to sell, the ETF actually does go out to the market and buy gold and silver and puts it into a trust. And, and you're actually able to follow how this is being done uh, by looking at the different prices. And you can actually make some pretty good predictions on what the rate of physical demand 
demands. And of course, if you know what the rate of physical demand is, you can probably make some predictions about where prices might be coming. I've always struggled until I started doing this, really putting together all of my, all the factors I think are important as to what they really mean for physical demand. But for just looking at these ETFs, it's, it's extremely simple. You don't need to look at eight, ten different things. You just look at this one thing and you know what it is. Well, this is the last question. Last question. Last question. Yeah. Just to let you know why, we actually have a dinner coming in here tonight, oh. and they actually want to set up in here very soon. Mm -hmm. very, very sure. oh. This is the recycling, the rate yeah. of recycle. How do you take into account those kinds of factors? Well, for example, I mean, there's a certain amount of hedging that you know that Eric does and that sort of thing. You, know, it, you can pretty much gauge a uh, certain amount of that hedging that occurs. When you start talking about recycling as the price goes up, there's certain factors that enter into the market that I suspect would affect this whole ballgame here as to the that's going to come out of the woodwork and wouldn't be otherwise necessarily coming out. Well, I think, you know, there's a diff, there, you know, you can look at micro factors and macro factors. Micro uh, factors are what you'd look at from a... Yeah, the, 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 okay, there's a... They need one a clarification on the question. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you can Oh, you want, okay. So yeah. the question is, I think, the, uh, let me, I guess I'll paraphrase it. Um, that um, as prices increase for gold and silver, some people uh, will increase the amount of recycling uh, of industrial recycling, or even, or even, like you know, the little sterling silver, a little gold, whatever. I mean, I see this all the way. All, I don't know if over here you guys see this, but there's a lot more. We buy gold, and that kind of thing going on, and you know, the, I don't know, if it's pawn shops or whatever. But they're all over the place. Okay, it's in radio. I even heard it on radio. So, you know, there's probably going to be more recycling, and therefore that stuff gets melted down and it adds to supply. So, how do I take that into account in price, in you know, price analysis? Is that, that's the question I have to And I, what I was saying is that, you know, I look at it as macro and micro factors. And, and the macro factors paint the background, but as far as the action, the today's action, this week's, or next month's, or whatever action, they really don't have a lot to, you know, a lot, a lot to say. But in terms of what the story is, or what, what where it's headed longer term, certainly that's something to be considered. Um, so if I'm uh, making a trade, Right, I'm buying futures, or I'm doing some other, you know, whatever spread trade or trading the basis. Uh, I would say doesn't doesn't factor in. But if I'm saying that, what is my ultimate target for exiting, you know, a position, a core position that I'm holding, then it could play into it. But of course, it, these are not numbers that anyone agrees to. And the best way you can determine that is just pick up the GFMS and the uh, what's the other one? The uh, that's the other one. Well, well, virtual metals, but then there's another one of your CPM group, okay? Uh, now, virtual metals coming on the scene, but they're a little bit behind. So you look at these two reports and you see how much they say from the cycle. And actually, if you pick up virtual metals, it says three times as much. And we're talking about, in the case of silver, like a couple of million ounces. So if there's that much disagreement, you know, yeah, it's really up in the air. Um, so I think if you look at it from a longer term perspective, that that would be one thing that could play into the future supply, but as far as the regular sort of every day or even looking forward a year or two, it really I don't think it plays into it at all. All right. Okay.